All right. Hello, everybody. It is 1 p.m. in New York. What, is, what time would it be in, in uh, oh, what, 10 a.m. in LA, California? Welcome to 44. Very excited to begin this journey with you all. Our first four guests, well, there are three. Myself makes four. It was a whole thing in my head that I actually initially wanted it to be four people plus myself, which would make five. And then I was like, well, I guess maybe <laughs> that title doesn't really make that much sense, does it? Um, so we have today Angela and Carol, Stephanie E. Goodall. Is it Goodall or Goodale? Goodall. Goodall. Good. Okay, good all, as well as Melissa Hunter Davis. So this afternoon, we're all gonna be in conversation about the intersections in our careers within art media, as well as the sort of larger ecosystem of this art world space and how we can change things to really present the work of black diaspora artists within the context that they deserve. Um, so what the format's going to be is that each of us will sort of talk a little bit about our career thus far, just what we've been thinking through, what brought us into this space, and how we hope to change it. Um, so, Angela, are you ready to begin? Hey. Yeah. yeah. So let me just read your bio really quick. Angela and Carol is an artist archivist and purveyor and investigator of art history and culture. She received her MFA in Digital Arts and New Media from the University of California at Santa Cruz and currently teaches within the Film and Moving Image program at Stevenson University in Baltimore. Her criticism has appeared in Baltimore Magazine, Be More Art, Sugarcane Magazine, and other publications. Thank you so much again, Angela, for joining us this afternoon. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I've uh, you know, been following your work as a curator for a while, so yeah, thanks for including me. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so um, I mean, I th if I'm thinking a little bit about like my history um, as an artist archivist and as a writer, it really starts with thinking about uh, the language of film, right? And the language of, of the visual image and using that as a sort of archive to tell the stories of black life and black creative genius. Mm -hmm. And so that's my background in, in film and animation. And the writing was more as a kind of poetic device, a kind of way also to tell narratives about our culture, our people, our genius. Uh, and it wasn't until I moved back to uh, Baltimore after finishing uh, grad school and after living in Oakland and doing a lot of um, community work and shooting documentaries uh, there uh, that I realized there was just a huge deficit around people who were actually writing and contextualizing the work of Black creative genius in Baltimore, a very, you know, a predominantly Black city um, versus the work that was happening. Uh, and so I started writing about that work maybe six, seven years ago in Baltimore to again try and counter the omission of Black creative genius in the city. And it's it's been a really phenomenal journey since then, right? I've been able to uh, cover a lot of people um, locally and um, not, you know, local, um, just Black creative genius all across the nation. Um, have been able to write for publications outside of the city like Hyperallergic and Arts.Black, um, done a lot of work with Black Art in America, um, as well as Sugarcane Magazine, which has been a really blessed um, opportunity to work with Melissa in those ways. And I think uh, really, rather than calling myself a critic, which I think is a very colonial term and a really violent term in relation to the history of how um, criticism has uh, completely ignored um, the work of Black uh, creatives, um, you know, and really even to the present, or has looked at the work and just completely missed the mark as far as being able to contextualize why the work is important, um, because their lexicon is steeped in European history and a European background, right, that does not, cannot catch all of the nuances of Black life or Black creative genius as it's been articulated. So, um, you know, I'm just excited to continue that work as a really a um, artist archivist, right, uh, is, is a less colonial term, I think, um, an observer, right, a, a witness to say, this is the work, um, this is the context of the work, an accurate context of the work that takes in the history of Black uh, aesthetics, 
um, the history of post-colonial theory, right, that often founds the work of Black creatives um, all across the diaspora. Um, and I feel really blessed to be able to, to do that work in the present um, so that when I have children and when they have children, um, we will have these canons that say, yes, we were here. And yes, we are, our stories and our narratives and our creations are worthy of archival. Awesome. You can continue if you'd like. You still have about two to three more minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I mean, that's, that's the background and we can, you know, we can dig into some other stuff later. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so next I will introduce Stephanie E. Goodall. Stephanie E. Goodall is a writer, storyteller, curator, and art historian who archives the geographical experiences of the African diaspora, especially those of women and femmes. Her writing has recently appeared in Art Papers, Bomb Magazine, and Burn Away. Past curatorial and programming endeavors include Bomb Oral History Live with Janet Olivia Henry and Sana Musa Sama at the Museum of Art and Design, Synesthesia, Color, Sound, and Iconography in Free to Be at Jenkins Johnson Projects, Other Articulations of the Real at the Hessel Museum, New York, and Click Click, Conversations on Black Photography. Again, thank you, Stephanie, for being here with us today. I really appreciate your time. And that goes for everyone and also the participants. Thank you all again for being here with us. I'm gonna mute myself, take it away. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I guess my journey on writing really came from me figuring out what curatorial studies and curatorship meant for me um, because at my core, that's what I align my practice with. And so for me, while in grad school, I found that the exhibition model wasn't enough for me. Um, it was, I was grappling with the fact that, okay, the exhibition comes down, what remains? And at the time I also felt that I was just overwhelmed with a lot of exhibitions and not enough writing about said exhibitions and by extension, the artists they were focusing on. And so I aligned myself with more of um, the writing aspects. Um, within that, I was really curious about geography and place and space in a way of trying to figure out um, who I am and where I'm going, where I came from, um, figuring out nuances of what's happening in a particular place, what's happening here, what's happening there, and how my Black personhood, my Black womanhood impacts those areas and how it is um, then affected by those areas. So for me, it was really important to see how um, Black women artists were using the land, using their narratives, and using their personal history through their individual practices, especially lens-based and sculptural practices, to communicate their experiences. So that's where I align myself. And I, I've been given like really great opportunities to be able to write for publications. Um, I'm kind of just getting started. Like all this is all still very new to me in a way, which is exciting. So it's like, okay, do I find that writing for online publications does me, satisfies me or does the work better? Do I find that writing for print publications um, satisfies me or does it well? Um, but most importantly, does it honor the work of the artist and the content that they're trying to produce? And so, that's really my place within writing. Much like Angela, I'm, I'm obsessed with the record of saying that we were here. And I don't like anyone telling me what happened when I was there, if they weren't there. And especially if you're speaking from an outsider perspective of trying to articulate a dynamic that you have nothing about, that you know nothing about, you have no connection to, and aside from connection, you're not invested in understanding the nuances of certain things. And so I'm like, let's cut the noise, let's get it direct from the source. So that's how I've ended up writing and yeah. Awesome, I feel like this is giving us so much um, great things to delve into when we all come together in discussion. 
Uh, Melissa, are you nearing readiness? I am. <laughs> okay. um, so originally from the Midwestern United States, Melissa is the founder of Sugarcane Magazine, a digital and print magazine focused on global black art. Melissa's background in the arts and keen eye inspired her to fill a niche that didn't exist, a location to learn about artists that share the same African heritage. Since starting Sugarcane, Melissa has worked with luminaries such as Danny Glover, Bayunga, Kia Luka, and Prism Art Fair. Her site is among the most popular destination for writers, content creators, and collectors that appreciate Sugarcane's global African perspective. She has over 20 years of experience in art administration, exhibition management, and theater production. Thank you also, Melissa, for joining us. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Please take it away. <laughs> so people always ask about Sugarcane, you know, how did you get started? Um, my background is in theater. I was a theater major in college, moved to Miami to major in theater. And as, as early as my freshman year, I was really bothered by some of the work that we did um, in our university classes that we never talked about Black playwrights, um, Black actors. And my professors didn't have a clue about any Black playwright. They only knew August Wilson, past August Wilson. They couldn't have a conversation with you. I, um, I talk about this sometimes with my kids just to give them you know, an idea of what the world holds for them. When I was in my directing class, I got docked 10 points on a project because I picked a playwright that he didn't know. When I asked about you know, working with a, a, a writer besides August Wilson, he said, I've never heard of these people. So I, was, I lost 10 points off of that project. So it's always been very important to me to talk about artists that look like me and make sure that not just Black people understand you know, our legacy, but also people that don't look like us understand our mark in the world, because we don't talk about that in any platform. So that was, the, the baby steps of where Sugarcane came from. Some years later, I worked for an arts organization and it was my job to put together an artistic season for them. And I just had to really work quickly. And I was shocked that there was not one place that I could go to find contemporary artists who were in performance space, who are exhibiting. And I just couldn't believe it. You know, at this point, this was the early 2000s. You know, the web was, you know, was hot then. And I was just shocked that no one put that together. So that's how this initially started. And it happened during um, the financial crisis of 2008. So that took print off the table and left me with doing just digital. So that's how we started. And when I realized that there was really a space for print because there was still nothing really dedicated to us, I decided to go ahead and take that leap. And in 2018, we got started with putting together our first print edition. Awesome. Okay, so I think uh, you all have said some things that I think will really bring us into a robust discussion together. Thinking specifically about this idea of criticism as violence, I really love that, Angela, like so much. And I think it's, it's really critical in terms of thinking about, as you were saying, Stephanie, this, this idea that for the most part, people are not necessarily interested in actually engaging with the real meat of what's beneath the visual elements of what is being seen in an exhibition. So I just wonder how each of you sort of approach that element of it. I know for you, Angela, Angela has actually reviewed two exhibitions of mine. Um, and one of the things that really struck me in particular with the first review was like, oh my God, she gets it. And I don't think I even had like a full discussion with you. And I really think that's that's a really um, that's a gift, honestly, to be able to fully identify just by looking. And I think also I like to I feel like the things that I've been writing of late, um, this idea of looking has come up a lot um, because to see and to look are two different things. Oh. Um, so maybe that's that's like a big question, but maybe we can sort of talk about that. Dying to know what you think. All of you, whoever wants to talk. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 um, I think the, I think we owe that right to artists to look at the work with a critical lens that sort of breaks from everything that all of us have been very conditioned with, right? Um, for any of us who have ever taken a history course or even an art history course, we know 
that the great histories, so-called great histories that we've been taught are steeped in a kind of false history, a false telling that says that white men are geniuses, right? That white men are victors, that the things that they have created um, stand the test of time and are worthy of archival and are wor worthy of canonization. And that if you ever want to be a, a, a great artist or even using the colloquial language of master, right? If you want to be a master artist, then you, you have to attain or uh, you have to sort of pursue them as your benchmark, right? And, and, and we know that that's a lie, right? And, and if you were in a kind of dynamic or diverse, you know, school or an HBCU, um, who had who actually said, "Hey, like, no, we're going to start with Porter, and we're going to look at, you know, uh, you know, we're going to look at uh, all of the huge legacy, right? Let, that even predates the Harlem Renaissance to the present of Black creative genius, and we're going to look at Brown creative genius, Latinx creative genius, and Asian uh, American contributions. Then you understand, and women's contributions and womenist contributions. Then you understand that history is something larger." than a consideration of the white imaginary, right? And I think so much of the work that I try to do is to, um, you know, because I go in and I think that's why I don't write as much now because it takes me a long time to process. Like I read before I write, right? Like I, I study and I research and I think about the things that are triggered for me when I look at a piece of work. And then I think about, you know, the theory or the writers that found my understanding of black consciousness, my understanding of, of history within a black context and see how that work and if that work sort of feeds into the work of those artists. Um, and um, similar to a lot of the folks on, on this panel, you know, I think I've have been moving beyond a state of just, I'm gonna just review a work so that we have, have it in the records and have moved into a more kind of critical assessment of how do we write something that is worthy of the archive, right? How do we create something that we can feel good about and that can be a kind of template that we return to over and over again to say, this is, this is what was happening in this moment, right? And this shows and proves, again, um, the creative genius that has always been here, right? Um, it proves, again, that, um, that our, our happenings and the things that we make and, the, and our, even our criticality about the work is important and relevant and worthy of disclosure, you know, and, and you can go in. Like, I've been reading a lot of like Fred Moten again, and I'm so excited about the talk that's coming up with him and um, in uh, Theaster Gates, you know, in, in the next few days. If y'all don't know about that, check that out. It's gonna, it's gonna be magical. If you don't know who Fred Moten is, uh, Google that brother, because <laughs> he is um, an amazing writer and, you know, uh, just warning, some of the work is rather dense, but uh, the way in which he talks- Rather dense. <laughs> <laughs> rather dense. Hilarious. That's a hilarious way to describe that. <laughs> <laughs> he goes in. But, um, but I think what I love about him and about other scholars and about, again, the opportunity to look at art and then to just think about it in ways of like, how do we talk about this in a way that just shows how amazing it is and how magnificent it is and how brilliant the people who created the work was, is to think about it within a Black uh, aesthetic, right? So if you talk about improvisation, you can talk about jazz, right? Like you can talk about that history. You, how do you talk about Jack Witten without talking about improvisation, without talking about jazz, without referencing Witten, I mean, without referencing Moten, without referencing Baldwin and his discussions of film and visual language and music and movement. Like there are all of these intersections that feed into the ways in which I am encouraged and have been encouraged to write about um, this work and, and I'm excited and, um, and feel really affirmed that people, um, that it resonates with folks, that they read the works and it's like, yeah, you know, cause I've had so many elders even who have come up to me and say, you know, like you are one of the first people who have written about the work, you know, and, and, and fully understood it, you know, and fully contextualize it. And that, and that makes me really angry, but it also makes me feel really proud, you know, um, and I'm trying to figure out how to get more younger folks to feel comfortable and confident, but also artists to feel comfortable and confident writing critically about the works that they create and the works that inspire them. I also try to make sure that as someone who has a publication to make sure that Angela is comfortable presenting pitches like that to me. You know, I don't want to have these conversations, just like I talk about the, the college situation. 
you know, where we had a problem with someone who had no idea who I was, you know, presenting to him. So making sure that writers feel comfortable saying that we have a home here and there's a place where we can have these critical dialogues where people will understand. And even if they don't understand, they'll take the time to understand. So that's, that's my contribution to this, is making sure that there's always a, a comfortable place for writers to go for this type of scholarship. Right. Um, I think for me, it's, I, I never experienced a world or I wasn't reared in a world where the Black imagination and Black artistic excellence wasn't possible. Um, like, that's just, a foreign concept to me and I don't align myself with thought processes or institutions that um, s that believe whiteness or predicate whiteness as the standard so it's just kind of like if you don't rock with it then that's not my problem um, like, I mean, it, you know, it's just like, I don't feel the need to center whiteness in anything that I do because I'm not white. Um, and the, unfortunately, the colonial imagination does seep into things. Um, and I think even within that, there has to be an intentional breaking away from it. Um, so it's just like my art history in college was very different from what I was engaging in with, um, in graduate school. So it's just like I, my art history was black art history, you know, and I think that's very special. And I also recognize how that is rare in many cases. Um, so for me, it was to always, for me, it was just standard. It was normal to write about black art. And it wasn't unfamiliar for me to be a, it wasn't unfamiliar for me to pitch about black artists. It's not foreign for me nor a betrayal of myself to say, this is what I'm gonna write about and stick to it. And there's more than one magazine, just like there's more than one bread company in the bread aisle, there's more than one magazine, there's more than one website and it's no harm, no foul to create your own and to create spaces where you and others can explore that. Like Wonder Bread isn't competing with the Wheat Bread Company, isn't like we all eat in. And so within that, it's I think once um, writers get comfortable with their positioning and who they are and what they represent, it's that space to say, okay, like the archive can then grow because I believe that there is a lot of fear there of backlash of rejection. And where it's just like, you can't operate like that um, because artists need us. You know, we each have our individual roles. We each have our own individual spaces and black art cannot survive nor thrive if the writers are afraid. So. That actually leads me into a few things. So a couple things, for those of you who are just joining us, this is 4-4, four four. this is the first edition of this weekly conversation series hosted by me, Nyama Sophia Sandy. Um, also, springboarding from something that I'm hearing and all of you saying, I wanna talk about what allowed you to find your voice within the context of you each beginning to path or build a pathway um, toward where you are right now and what you ultimately would like to do for the future. What is the mechanism through which that happened individually for each of you? Also, for those of you who are joining us, um, can you please make sure that any questions that you're asking can go into this Q&A bit, which would be somewhere toward the bottom of your screen if you're using a computer. Uh, and again, thank you everyone for joining. Whoever wants to take on that one first can. I'm muting myself now. So I think, I can't tell you where I found my voice necessarily um, or the, the confidence to do this. I just knew that it was for me. I think I just followed what I felt was my movement towards this area that this is where this was for me and that yeah. this is where I should be. There was no one thing or no one epiphany. I just knew that this is where I should go. 
I can tell you what kept me from giving this up was meeting someone in Miami, I think around 2014, um, that was at a, a breakfast and this guy, you know, just sat next to me and he's like, hi, you know, what's your name? So we started talking. And when I told him what I do, he pulled out a cup, he was an older gentleman, he pulled out pages from my guide to black art for, for our Basel Miami Beach. And he was like, oh, I use this to get around the city. And you can see where like he circled where he wanted to go. And when I realized that this was really important for him, that, you know, this was how he navigated through Miami that weekend, I realized that there was a real need for this. And that kept me on, on this space. And just watching, you know, different, you know, different artists and seeing them, you know, really grow from when they first started, who may have been in the, the magazine years ago, the awesome writers that I have and the work that they do, it, it keeps me going. So I know that this is something that will be around for a while. This is not a, a sprint so that I could go yeah. off and do something just, you know, marketing myself. This is a real legacy project that I expect to continue for many years. Yeah. Um, there was something in what you just said, this idea of confidence, like confidence is a sort of ongoing thing. And I think confidence building is an ongoing exercise. And I think um, for many of us, we don't like realize that. And we think like it's, as you were just saying about something entirely different, but it isn't a destination. Like it is, it's somewhere that you find within yourself time and time again in different ways. Um, and I think that's important in terms of this, this idea about finding voice because your voice will shift and it'll expand and it may contract also. So um, whoever else wants to take on that question as well. Um, I think it just happened for me organically. Um, I think that it's very rare for black diasporic folks to not get some sort of backlash from their communities when they say, oh, I wanna, I wanna work in art. Cause they're just like, well, how are you gonna live? You know, um, and I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by people who um, nurtured that. Like my parents didn't question me, which, which is like, <laughs> They were just like, okay. They were like, that's what you want to do? Okay. Um, so I think that gave me the confidence. Um, and to also be surrounded by people who nurtured that, where they were like, how, where they were asking me questions to push me and providing constructive criticism to push me and to nurture me. And because I know me personally, I'm still very early in my journey of what it means to write about art, what it means to critically engage in art. And I will say that the roles of mentorship, of being supported and being surrounded by those who care about you mm -hmm. um, and who understand your position. Yeah. And those who will keep you in line. It's important to have that intellectual lineage that's going to say, look, I know that this is scary, but you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Like there are people who came before you, who are beside you, who are behind you, who support you in this and understand that your writing isn't for now, it's for the future. And that's something that continually encourages me where it's like, mm, where sometimes I'm like, mm, that review felt a little rough. And they're like, you know what? That's okay. No piece of writing is ever done. No, no train of thinking is ever done. Just keep going. And that's what you have to do. You have to keep going despite the critics, despite the criticism, because it's like we see what happens when we allow others to write about our art. It's just all off base. And so understanding and knowing that your position is critical, your voice is critical, is what matters. Mm -hmm. um, if I may say, you said like twice, you've made allusions to um, your sort of newness. I'm gonna tell you right now, that doesn't matter. You're doing the damn thing and you should really be uh, proud of the work that you've done thus far. And I'm very excited about what you will do moving forward. 
So I just felt the need to say that because I feel like you've mentioned it multiple times um, in your speaking thus far. Stop doing that. Give yourself some credit. Angela. Oh, okay. Word, because I've checked out uh, a little bit of the oral history project that you're doing and it, and it looks really amazing. And there were so many elders in that list that I was not, I was not familiar with their work. And, you know, and that's, that says something, you know, um, cause I'm a nerd, I read a lot. <laughs> so I appreciate that that kind of archive and reference exists and that we can go to it and we can use it as a guide and we can leap board on it and we can collaborate through it and we can add to it, you know, like you, that's something you created. That's a platform that didn't exist prior. So word. Um, but as far as um, finding voice, I grew up in a very religious, very strict um, home. Uh, I don't know if y'all know about Kojic, Pentecostal. It is a whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> it is a whole thing. I and, know. Yes. Wow. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for it um, because it, you know, it was a springboard from which I could go into African traditional sciences and, and understand that possession and all of these things are, are African and Black and, you know, the origins of these things. Um, but because my parents were so strict, so much of my time was spent uh, at home, like reading and in reading what was on their shelves and um, watching a lot of film and watching a lot of cinema and listening to my father's music collection, you know, and so, so much of my consciousness, even though we were in a very white neighborhood and I went to very white schools, was founded in, in Black culture, right, and, and in Black histories. And, and so because my parents didn't have too many like children's books, from a very young age, I was reading Roots. I was reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. I was reading Toni Morrison's Sula. I was reading Baldwin. You know, I was reading that work in elementary and middle school. I mean, with a dictionary, right? Because a lot My of- <laughs> and And, um, you know, but it's, and they would be like, okay, well, if you come to a word that you don't understand, like go to the dictionary and find the word. Figure. But that, what it did is it created an understanding, you know, similar to what Stephanie was talking about, where it was like, you never, you will never doubt who you are, the importance of the work that, that precedes you. You will never doubt the validity of Black, um, of Black presence in the world. You will never doubt who you are. So that, all of that founded my my understandings from a young age which i'm so 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 grateful for because it allows us to go into um it allowed me to go into the future and into the present with that understanding right like not having to sort of build myself up um because the world is you know can be very violent as we know right as we know very violent psychologically and emotionally and physically to black black bodies black presence black genius right there's something very um, intimidating to the world um, when you are intelligent, when you um, stand on your, when you go on your guards, when you uh, decide to say, I'm going to specifically talk about black history, right? Black creative genius. I'm specifically focusing on that. I could talk about a whole bunch of other stuff, but this is my focus. People are afraid of that. And I think I always return to like the Toni Morrison clapback video where, where, you know, the white woman is like, well, why, you know, why would you just focus on, you know, black people? Like, isn't that limiting, right? You're, you're a writer. And if you're really a writer, then why would you only focus on black people? And, she, you know, and she just cuts, just, you know, slices through the silliness of that, of that logic. And um, so, yeah, so, so my voice is steeped in in all of the shoulders that we stand on, all of the giants, literary and creative giants that found our understanding. And, um, and, and I'm grateful for that. And I think that's what encourages me to, to keep going as well, right? Like my voice is continuously elevated and, and informed and affirmed by other you know, writers and other creatives um, that I'm seeing uh, doing work. Everybody on this panel, you know, folks, that are beyond here, other cur curators like Larry Ose Mensa and other, you know, creators. Um, I mean, so many, too many to name, right? Um, but I think that that kind of solidarity and moving in that kind of solidarity with other creatives is also something that I always want to be likened to my voice because, because I know that I, you know, I believe in the Ubuntu logic, right? Like I am because we are, right? Like, and I think I always give a kind of side eye to anybody who would move from a space of divisiveness, right? Or who would try and 
find divisions within black communities or within uh, black creatives and instead of sort of looking for solidarity. Um, I think that that is also a violence and also a product of a, a kind of colonial mindset. Um, you don't have to pray like me, right? Like you don't have to read what I read, but if you stand in solidarity with standing for black creation, then I rock with you, right? Then I fuck with you. And that's, and that's what we need to do more consistently, I think. And uh, that's what I want to encourage, that's what encourages my voice. And that's what I want to use to encourage other people's voices as well. Amen, Angela. I feel like, yeah, that, yeah that's, yep, absolutely. I need to clap for that one. Um, hmm. So you've all answered that question. I suppose, I guess we can sort of, we have about four questions that are, oh, five now. Yes. Five questions that have been asked here. Oh, well, we can do that now. Um, will each panelist please provide the audience with their social media handles? So if you all will maybe put that in the chat for people to have a look at. Um, oh, I guess I could have typed an answer too. Oh, well, too late now. <laughs> um, so thank you for that, Ajamu. Also, again, thank you to everyone who has joined us. Krista David has asked a question about whether you can recommend artists who you think personally are doing good jobs about critically writing about their work. And I'll mute yourself, yeah. Writing about their own work or oh. writing about? Yeah, writing about their own work. Oof. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself and think about it. Yeah, I can't think of anyone who writes about their own work. Yeah. Or even, so maybe Krista, can you sort of provide us with some clarification if I give you at least not visual artists. Now, if you're talking about maybe in theater, yes, but visual artists, I don't know of any. Krista, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Are you ready for that? Yeah, cool. So you can clarify what you mean. Oh wait, unmute. Hi. Can you Hi. Hear me? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to, um, I'm just curious about, because I think um, someone mentioned earlier in the conversation, one of the panelists, about um, having artists write more about their own work. And I've heard this a couple times in like studio visits I've had with different curators and galleries, this Im the importance of um, situating your own work before other people have all, you know, all all of these other things to say about your work, but, but you as an artist really taking the time to think about, and I have two minds on this. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm, I'm on board with this, but this, this idea of taking the time to fully articulate what it is you're trying to communicate in your own work first. And this doesn't necessarily have to be something that you publish, but just as a part of your practice mm -hmm. for archiving it and documenting it so that you can work um, more successfully with curators, if that is part of your aspirations. But so I'm just really curious about sort of like, you know, I know that there are artists like um, 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 Kara Walker has written some essays about her work, or um, Lynette um, Yadim um, Boachi has written some some things about her work. Just sort of just yeah, I was just curious about it. Like, how should we do it? Should we incorporate it as a part of our practice? Um, who's doing it really well? Is this something that's essential or should artists just really focus on like, I'm just making this work and co-collaborate with curators who do a lot of the heavy lifting around thinking and, mm -hmm. and um, critically um, analyzing the work, that kind of thing. So just some tips. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm just making my work at this point. <laughs> Maybe, um... Tracy Morell in Atlanta. I think she she articulates her, her vision well. Um, I always have a hard time saying his last name, Fahamu Peku. Yeah. It's my brother. Yeah. yeah, so he probably does as well. Oh, uh, Tracy is her so student. That's okay. Tracy's your friend. That's nice. So yes. Um, so if I may, um, because I've I've sort of like 
I guess, like I said, this is the first version of this. So I have no idea how I'm going to do this, like how much I am placing myself into the conversation because this is, I don't really see this as being about me. If you just joined us, part of what I was thinking about in terms of creating this was like, who am I not hearing from? Who do I want to see? And that's black women. So I wanted to make sure that, um, obviously I am also a black woman. So <laughs> Uh, I suppose it shouldn't be ridiculous for me to consider imparting myself into these conversations. But um, I've been finding that I think it's really a lot more helpful for people to be able to speak succinctly about the work. And sometimes that actually comes from them having written about it um, in a way that allows them to kind of like create a sight line for themselves, if that makes sense, Krista. Um, and I think this is just a general good practice, even as writers, as curators, as archivists, as historians, when you commit something to paper, to words on paper, that changes everything. And it really becomes like an act of manifestation as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I like that notion of active manifestation, right? Um, and I can think of a few folks who are working in like moving image who have written about their work pretty, pretty interestingly, like Artha Jaffa and um, Haile Jirima, um, because again, their work was not considered. So they had to write about their own work, right? Um, because people were looking at the work and then saying like, I don't understand what you're doing, right? Um, or really only respecting like Charles Burnett because they could compare it to like Italian realist, right? But what, when you look at all of the other Black filmmakers or other Black creatives who were doing work again steeped just in the Black aesthetic, it was kind of like over the head of all of the white critics because they just didn't have that, that history or that understanding. But I think it's important, and again, because I'm an artist and a writer, right? Um, background in illustration, animation, film, all of these things. Um, but I think it's important for you to know why you're doing what it is that you're doing and to at least be able to articulate, you know, as was stated, um, what it is that you're doing. And I've been trying to think about how to teach that, right? Like how to, how to show folks and encourage folks that their, their voices are valid. Because I think often, again, the ways that we've been indoctrinated is, you know, is that you have to be kind of singular in your presentation, right? If you're a writer, then all you do is write, right? So people just see you in this, put you in a writer box. If you're um, a creative, then all you do is create and you give the writing and the criticality and the business to other people. But I was in conversation with Michelaine Thomas around her exhibition at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And one thing that she was saying is that so much of what her and her partner are trying to do is trying to encourage artists to understand and learn what they have not learned in school, right? How to advocate for themselves, how to move with agency. And a lot of that agency is you know, writing about your work, knowing how to do that, understanding the business of the art world for yourself, right? Beyond what is told to you by, by a gallerist or by, um, by an agent. Um, just that advocacy and that agency, I think is so important, particularly for black creatives, because ain't none of us wearing one hat, right? Like you can't be black in America and just do one thing. Like that just isn't, you can't be a woman <laughs> in America or in the world and just do one thing. All of us are out here grinding, doing, you know, running multiple, multiple races and um and trying to live and just be extraordinary and not be killed right for being extraordinary right which which is another thing to consider but i but i have been thinking about that a lot Kristen. i think it's a really important question around how do we um how do we encourage people to uh to stand in and to be able to articulate what it is that they're doing and why it is that they're doing it and how do you teach that right like how do you show people hey um you don't have to be an art historian to understand the importance of the histories that are informing your work. And if you ever, you know, engage or ask questions of an artist about like, hey, what informed this work? They can tell you, you know, what's going down in a way that maybe they won't be able to write about um, what's happening. So just as a, a tip for me is sometimes if, cause sometimes I'm better at articulating things than I am at writing it down initially, um, is sometimes just record yourself talking about what it is that you do and the work that you do and then listen to that recording and then use that as a basis to write about what it is that you're doing. And then you have a kind of meta archive yourself, right? Of, um, you know, of a recording about the work you have, or you can do a video recording of yourself discussing the work. And I think that's actually just a really good exercise and a good practice to get into the habit of being able to discuss what it is that you do and why it is that you do it.
And I just shared that with a friend of mine who has wanted to be a writer for a long time. And I just told him, I said, look, use your voice recorder, you know, map out what you want to write and then go ahead and record it. And I said, we can edit that later. You know, we can clean it up, you know, and make it look pretty later. I said, but, you know, get the story out first. So that's a, a, an easy way to do it. You know, you can transcribe it later. You can get somebody to transcribe it for you. But that's your first four-way, four-way into it. That's really good, Angela. Awesome. So that actually leads me to another thing that we sort of talked about in our little practice session before we began broadcasting to everyone. What are these multiple hats that you all wear and what are the ways that you sort of, <laughs> don't roll your eyes. <laughs> um, multiple hats. <laughs> what, are, what are the ways that you sort of see them coalescing into a sort of overarching vision of what you want your work to be and what you want it to do and how you want it to function for others and also again this idea of the long-term long arm of what we're doing and what that impact is going to be so i call sugarcane my third child i have two and sugarcane is you know my third kid um so i look and i tell people all the time that i have to you know i produce my family this is not just a you know, oh, well, everybody can do what they need to know. You know, I have to run that. <laughs> and I have to run this. So, you know, we're not, I tell folks sometimes that we weren't necessarily meant to be in this space. You know, when you talk about arts journalism, when you talk about galleries, when you talk about museums, you know, there was no thought about Black people being a part of this journey. There was no thought about a Black woman being able to do this. You know, this is typically run by wealthy families who have some money that they need to clean up or they need a tax write-off. Mm -hmm. And this becomes a thing for them. This is not a, a legacy project for many of them. So, but it is for me. So it takes on a, a completely different role, different responsibilities, um, yet, you know, still trying to do the work when you don't have a, a trust fund to come with it to, to take care of everything for you, you know, so that you can just, you know, have everything come out of your personal account without it being an issue. So there's always, I think somebody put in the chat, 511 hats. There's always so many that I have to do. Um, I was just lucky enough, and Angela's is a good tip for you. So we now have an assistant. You can talk to them. Yeah, I know, because there are certain things that I just, I don't always have the mental bandwidth to cover. <laughs> so that's her job. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a struggle, but we're always doing different things to keep this afloat, making sure that, you know, our children feel satisfied, um, that they're doing things creatively to, to keep them feeling confident about themselves and that, that they can use that as the way to express themselves, as having a different voice. So all of this, you know, leads into Sugarcane being the same way. You know, I look out for my writers, making sure that they are okay and that they have a place to put their work. And even when they're not pitching because they have their own personal issues, you know, making sure that I let them know when you get through this, or if you need to get through this, that this platform is here for you. If you need to get this out on paper and stick this here, I'm fine with that. You know, we can move on. It doesn't necessarily have to be arts criticism. It can simply be a short story about how you're handling COVID and how you're handling losing your job and how you don't know if you're going to make enough money to pay for your flat, but you still have to go to school. You still have one more year left at university. So as overwhelming as it is, it's such a natural part of life for me that you just keep up with it. Brilliant. Do you need me to repeat the question? Yes? Is yeah. That, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so the question is essentially, so this, this question of um, us sort of being pulled in all of these different directions, how do you sort of reconcile that in terms of, so in your case, Stephanie, you are also thinking about curation, you're also thinking about, um, you know, producing programming and all of these things. What, what is the sort of like vision forward plan for yourself in terms of thinking about all of that as a coalescing of one thing for you does that make sense right um i don't i'm still chewing on it because i ideally for myself i see myself moving towards um 
the book format. I like the format of having the artifact of the book, of the magazine, of the object, um, but also expanding that thinking into thinking of more voice-based um, communications in that way and seeing where that lands. Um, when you say voice-based, what do you mean? A la podcast, radio. Um, literally voice-based, okay. <laughs> literally literally vo voice-based. Um, but also wanting to approach that with a particular care um, and nuance. Um, there are some people who can just pop things out like boom, 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 boom. I am not that, I am a crock pot. It's gonna take a while. And when you have it, you will enjoy it. Um, so- Please never make that analogy ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, and so, I'm still figuring that out. Um, for right now, I'm enjoying the slow process of writing and what that entails. Um, and we'll find out when we get there, so. I'm into that, I'm into that. Angela, what you got? Um, yeah, I think uh, my first kind of love is has always been uh, cinema, you know, the, the, the visual, visual language um, and, and the moving image and that the liter and then literary as well. And so I've always just in my education, in my work, post school, undergrad and grad school and all of the things, it has always been about how do I, how do I bring those things together? And I think even now, um, so much of the work that I do is about kind of trying to bridge, bridge those, those worlds um, because so much of black creative genius is not, um, is again, not singular, it is dynamic, you know? And so, you know, just thinking of creative ways to show our histories um, has been a kind of obsession <laughs> for me. Uh, and I'm currently a Saul Zance Innovation Fellow, which is through the Johns, Johns Hopkins University. And that focuses on film and, and documentary and feature films and so I'm working on a thing that I can't really rap about too too much but um hope to hope to launch as soon as uh Rona lets us lets us out into the world <laughs> and we're able to shoot without um you know imperiling ourselves or 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 others um but yeah I mean I think so much of the work that I'm trying to do is just figure out how do we even this notion of the archive which is why I really appreciate your project Stephanie you know like how do we think about these things in more dynamic ways like are we reading, you know? Um, I mean, I'm reading, right? I, I know a lot of the folks in, in my circle are reading. Are my little cousins reading? I don't know, but they watch a lot of visual content, right? Um, and a lot of that content is garbage. And, and I'm so concerned about how, what they are consuming is, uh, how they are being indoctrinated by what they're consuming. And so the question for me is always, how do we, write in ways that are accessible but are also critical how do we create visual content that is accessible um but also intelligent right and no shade to the you know reality television all the things whatever i'm not a fan of it but like no shade to it if that's your escape or if that's you know what you need to do to just tune out of all of the silliness that's happening in the world but i do think that there's something to be said about curating um and being really conscientious about how what we consume and what we create for others to consume is it uplifting us is it making us more intelligent is it encouraging us is it giving us some is it arming us right and is it arming our children is it arming us not just in the present but is it arming us in the future to be able to say we have we have a present and we have a future right because i think that that's just uh it's important for our survival it's always been important for our survival and and so that uh so the bridging of that those worlds is still something that i'm figuring out and um still something that i'm um i'm really hopeful about and really inspired by like i'm sure all of us or a lot of us were watched the conversation with uh with uh aunties angela davis and and nikki giovanni and one of the things that came out of that conversation that was really encouraging was just like yo like look to yourselves right? Like, look to yourselves for those answers. Like, y'all are asking the questions to the wrong people about whether you're beautiful and whether you're worthy and whether you're, the work that you're doing is relevant. 
look to yourselves. And when I look to my left and I look to my right and I look to the sisters that are on this panel, I'm so encouraged, yo. Like, I'm so encouraged and I'm so inspired because like we doing the work, you know, like we're trying to in the ways that we can, you know, like we're doing the work and that, and that says something. So we, yeah, I went on a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> what you can't see, I think, uh, was that, well, you can see it, but they can't see it. I was giving her the stank face, you know, when like somebody hits a lick in a piece of music and you're like, that's, <laughs> that's what I was doing. Um, okay, so we are at about five minutes to two. I would like us to wrap up, but there is one thing that I wanted to sort of touch on. So in your bio, Stephanie, I read out loud this the mention of the bomb project, specifically with Sana and um, Janet Henry. And I was like, oh, did you know that I like worked on a project that maybe technically is connected to how that happened? And she was like, yep, I did. And I was like, oh. Like you to tell me that you knew that. And I wondered about like how we are thinking about lineage and how we're thinking about, I think, I don't remember which one of you said it, but you use the term intellectual lineage, which I really loved. Um, and I, did, did you raise your hand mm -hmm. as though? <laughs> that was me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm just thinking about that. Cause I think that's not something that we talk about enough in general. Um, and thinking about, again, like, we don't do this alone. One hand can't clap, as they say, right? Um, this is all formed by the work of so many people who came before us, as you said, Stephanie, who stand beside us, who stand in front of us. Um, and I think, I just wonder what you think about that. And perhaps that can be the sort of closeout thing. I'm very sorry to everyone. <laughs> questions we didn't answer. I mean, actually, are you all comfortable going a little bit, like another 10 more minutes? Yeah, is that cool for everybody? I'm fine. I've answered some of the questions, some, some questions. Yeah. In here. Okay, but this question now. <laughs> Whoever wants to go first. Nobody? You ask it again. I think yeah. I probably have. Question about um, intellectual legacy and heritage and just like how you see even who are the people that maybe you feel like your work is directly in connection to in conversation to as it relates to black people in this specific area of art media. Um, yeah. And that could be curators, that could be other writers. Go on. So I can tell you that I have a lot of pride um, when it comes to Angela and one of my writers, Adam Patterson, who is in, he's in Europe, I forgot where, Amsterdam, yeah. I believe, Amsterdam. Rotterdam, um, I love Adam. And yes, love and Adam. he's, um, I, I think he's either from Barbados or London, or both. Barbados. Um, it's because of their work that I continue on with this, making sure that there's a, an archive of their writings and the way they see the world. So, and that brings me joy. It brings me joy that some of my daughter's friends um, follow Sugarcane on, on social media. And these are like 15, 16 year old girls. Um, part of it is to spy on their friend's mother, <laughs> but the other part of it is, um, it gives them an education that even if they, some of them may not get now, they will understand the gravity of it when they get older. I know that we always talk about, you know, we are afraid for the next generation because, you know, they have reality television and we didn't have that when we were younger. But I would always say that even with that, I would always say, you know, stand still because you never know what that turns into later on. There's enough of the work that we're doing that at least people are paying attention to that they will come back this way later in life. So just being able to, to stand strong in that. And the fact that I have people like Angela and Adam, I have their work that I archive in perpetuity, that this will be a conversation for future generations. Awesome, thank you. Um, I would definitely say that I resonate most heavily with those who are who question their origins who want to know where they came from um 
where their ancestors came from, um, the nuances of blackness. Um, blackness is not this monolith. It's not one picture. Uh, my blackness may be different from your blackness, your blackness, your blackness. But at the end of the day, our roots are what connect us. And the exploration of that is worthwhile. Um, it's ancestral veneration. It's legacy building. It is um, archive building. And it's critical engagement with the world around us. And I see that as one of the highest honors um, to be able to say that this land gave me this, um, these people gave me this, they gave me this culture, they gave me this knowledge, they gave me this inheritance, and to be able to interact and to grapple also, quite frankly, um, with that information, um, it's a pleasure. Um, but also a privilege to be able to engage it in the critical forms in which all of us are doing in our own ways. Amazing, thank you. Angela? Um, yeah, I feel like I uh, answered a little bit of this in the, the last time I spoke, and I spoke a lot. <laughs> so I'm you kind of did, you kind of did. So if, I don't know if you um, have some, Yeah, I'm, 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 inspired by, I'm inspired by great thinkers and um, great thinkers in folks who are writing, you know, powerful work, folks who are um, using the visual in interesting and dynamic ways. I have a goal to like write as eloquently and interestingly and wittily as like Hilt Mouse, <laughs> you know, and, um, and to get that kind of, uh, be able to literally just survive off of writing and art would, would, would be amazing and figuring out how to do that. Um, I'm inspired by scholars like Dr. David C. Driscoll, who we just lost, who just became a powerful egungun for us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so many others who, again, are just inspiring us to continue to do the works, right? To just pick up the torch where they've left off mm -hmm. and, and to continue to do the works. And so I just, you know, I, I feel encouraged to do that. And I hope other folks feel encouraged to do that as well. Brilliant. Um, so I have a question from Dominique Clayton. Thank you, Dominique. Um, can we discuss monetizing writing and publishing different avenues for making it a sustainable practice? Also, we need more of our own publishing companies and media outlets. That last part wasn't a question. <laughs> but what do, you, what do you all think? Obviously, Melissa, I think as, as the editor among us, as the founder among us, publisher among us, I think you may have some more insight than most of us do. So someone else asked a similar question um, for, first of all, we're not the only ones out here. Sugar King is not the only one. Culture Type is not the only one. Black Art in America is not the only one. There are many other smaller sites doing the same work, um, but they don't get the traffic or the attention. So to make that happen, if you want to help us monetize and be able to pay you, one of the things that we have to do is talk about us share our post, um, talk about us as much as you talk about hyperallergic. If you can do that, if you can talk about as much as you talk about Artnet, if you can talk about us as much as you talk about Artsy, that would help us pick up our, our profiles and allow us to pay more because then we can get advertising and then we can make those payments and we can make it happen. But when you don't do that, then it appears that we don't exist and then we're not as important. And then it becomes much harder for us to be able to monetize these platforms. So those are the things that we need to think about when we want that. And we do need, there should be many of us doing this work. I mean, we shouldn't just be the creators for other people to consume. You know, we should speak about this work on many different platforms from many different angles, um, many different things. You know, you should be looking at film, you should look at music, you should look at, at writing. This should all happen, but a lot of times this doesn't really work because we're not buying and we're not talking about us. That's the reason why Ebony's not around anymore. That's the reason why Essence can't get, um, um, doesn't have a competitor because nobody has the, the confidence or feels like they can do this because nobody's giving them as much support as we would someone else. So until that happens, 
will be stuck here. So it starts off with, you know, if you want this, show support for it. Because then also others who are thinking about doing this but thought, well, maybe we can't be successful, they won't do it because nobody's talking about us. But hyperallergic is shared all day, all night. So if we want all this to happen, if you, if you like Angela so much, when you see something by Angela and Sugarcane, I should see a thousand shares. But if something comes up in Artsy, you guess it's 2,000. So if you want us to do that, you have, there has to be a support for that. And that allows us to give you, also give you the, the quality of writing that you want because then we can pay these writers more so that it's something that they can do for a living and it makes sense for them. Whereas now for most of us, it wouldn't make sense to us for a lot of other, a lot of writers to come to us because we may not be able to pay as much as the New York Times. Or even when we, we have done it, it's just not sustainable because you still need that support behind it. Awesome, thank you. I hope that answered the question in the way that you hoped, Dominique. Thank you again for that question. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. This is another really good one. Chloe Austin has asked, how have the panelists found their voices as writers considering the history of elitism and whiteness and art criticism? And how has this seeped into the language of some publications? I think also I want to connect this with a question that Eddie Miles asked earlier. Uh, in, I'm wondering how much, including HBCUs, the role of academia has as a formal institution contributes to this false benchmarking that Angela referred to earlier. Do any of the artists feel that the academic ivory tower is prohibitive of the proliferation of Black art as as a or the benchmark for our people or our consumers at large? Really excellent questions, I think. Everyone is muted. <laughs> I'm all muted now. So yeah, I would, um, it has been problematic. I go back to that time in college. It was a scene from Ceremonies and Dark Old Men. And I could have easily switched up to something by Tennessee Williams because I was a big Tennessee Williams fan. But I didn't do that because I felt that as a professor, you should go look up the play, go look up the playwright. That's not my problem. So I, go, I gladly took that 10%, you know, cut in my grade. Mm. That's fine. Because that's not that's what I mean. Crazy that story is crazy. You know, and we can do that. But that was also just, that's my story, but that's not an exclusive story. That's yeah. a story for, for many people. One of my interns, she graduated from college, I think in 2009. And she said they still didn't talk about Black artists in her art history classes. She said she had everything that she learned about Black artists, she learned on her own. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the university system has everything to do with that. And I'm not sure that that has changed very much. I literally think that social media has been a saving grace for tons of young people who are interested in this space, that everything that they've learned, they've learned from us. And even some of the folks in the chat, some of the participants, they've learned from you too. The Dominique, the Tashas, absolutely. Yashua, Mikhail, that if, if not for us, they would end up, you know, researching on their own sometime after they graduate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, in my case, interestingly, I actually went to Howard, but my degree from Howard is not at all related to art in any way. Um, is actually a journalism. Well, actually it is, isn't it? Take that back. Um, it is actually a degree in journalism with the concentration in public relations. And it was very much, um, at the time, you know, I was like 17. I ain't no shit for real. And so, um, but my minor was actually in Caribbean studies. And then moving forward, I actually decided to do my master's in anthropology on purpose rather than art history. Because again, like, I think we've had enough of these conversations about white men and their contributions to the world. What, what is there for us to say about ourselves? What is there for us to say about the connections that exist between us in this last, particularly the 20th century and what, what that sort of births in terms of cultural movements, in terms of visual um, ideology and iconography, what, what does that do? And that was very much at the heart of what I was thinking about and what I'm trying to do with my work. Um, but I've never 
kind of similar to Angela. I never, I've never ever felt like I couldn't do something or I didn't belong somewhere. And I've been in some very white spaces in my life, right? Um, I think it's, it's really just a matter of being in the right environment. For me, I, I got very lucky. You know, I'm from Brooklyn, like outside my window every Labor Day was the Labor Day parade. That in and of itself, Carnival is, you know, I mean, you could say a lot of things about it right now, but in terms of the origin space that it comes from, that is a direct conversation with resistance. That's a direct conversation with cultural retention, um, whether that's the Amerindian populations or West African. Yes, definitely a source of self-regard. Absolutely. Um, and thinking about all of that, like, how could I not love myself? How could I not do this work and want to, like, amplify the voices of those around me whose work I think is important. Is that making sense? Um, and that's the other reason why it's important for us to continue this work because I think all of us seem to come from, from places where we were the majority. And so we saw ourselves in, in a very realistic light. We saw ourselves, you know, in glory, you know, wealthy, well-traveled, intelligent. And then we saw what we could be, you know, with issues and, you know, poverty. I know that's how I grew up, you know. I'm from Gary, Indiana, it was a chocolate city. So I saw very wealthy people, I saw crackheads. It was all a part of the world. So you saw everything that you can be. But if you look at young people now, they don't grow up like that. For most of us, we've moved to the suburbs for whatever the reason is, you know. And so they're surrounded by people who not only don't look like them, but don't care about them. And their only image is through, um, reality television, maybe music. So they lose that sense of self. So the work that we do is very important because now they get, they get a chance to see other options and other opportunities and you know things that they can be and things that they can do without just feeling like I could only you know, go into music and be a rapper. I can only go into sports or I can only do what my parents did and go work for government or, you know, get a nine to five. But they see that they can have these creative opportunities and, and really make something of a life that they're proud of and that they're happy to be a part of. Um, I would definitely say that my voice was cultivated in undergrad. I mean, I went to a HBCU. Um, I attended Spelman, and so, and I also had the, I also um, was a student assistant in our museum, so there was never no, oh, you can't do this, it's like, no, go rewrite that, because that's not where it needs to be. If anything, the foot was on my neck to amplify what I'm doing, um, and within that understanding going back to intellectual legacy there wasn't an opportunity for me to say that oh no one around this has done around me has has done this before you know and it was just like no like go to your archives go read up on who was here go read up on this go read up on that go do your research for yourself not because someone told you that this happened but because you know that it happened for a fact and understand and trust in that. And so when I was in these very white spaces, these very spaces that weren't for me, catered for me, built for me, there was no negating my voice. Like there'd be popular artists of various backgrounds. I'm like, oh, who that? I'm like, that's not, that's not my art history. Like, that's cool for you, but you're not going to tell me that your canon is my canon because that's not the case. And because your canon is the majority voice or the popular voice or the more publicized voice, that that's the case. Because no, that that's not the case. Like, that's not how we rock over here. And so I guess in a way I have that luxury of being able to say, take it or leave it, um, because a lot of others don't. Um, yeah, I think, I think, um, there's some immense power in that, that, that foundation is essentially unshakable and nobody can ever stand in front of you and negate your work. Yeah. And I think that's, that's incredibly powerful. Like, it's very odd for me to hear when people don't know black women artists, 
I'm like, what you mean? Mm -hmm. Like, we out here, we've been out here, we've been doing it. Like, how, how could you not? Mm -hmm. Like, how could you deny this glory? How could you deny this, this excellence, this brilliance, this illustriousness, this wonder, this amazement? How could you deny it? And then tell me that we don't exist? Bish, please. <laughs> like, we not like we not doing that it's true okay well angela do you want to add anything to that <laughs> she just put her, she just put her hands up like this as to say no i'm good well i think that's a good place to end it it's about 2 15 um so we've gone about 15 extra minutes thank you all again so so much I think this was a great start to this series. I'm really excited to see what's going to happen here. Um, please look out for the next announcement of who's going to be joining us next Saturday. Um, again, thank you each. Incredible, incredible contributions to this conversation, incredible contributions to the field. And I appreciate all of you. And I appreciate those of you who have stuck it out and stayed this extra 15 minutes. So thank you very much. Have a great day. If you're in New York, enjoy the sunshine while social distancing <laughs> and thanks again all right be well safe and stay yes stay safe